Well, good morning and welcome home, everyone. My name is Summer, and like many of you, I call PCC my home. Now, this isn't how I expected to be gathering here in 2021, and honestly, I'm kind of sad about it, but I really am thankful to still be able to worship together with you. Speaking of worship together, hello, kids. Did you know that we have a super awesome fun activity packet? I have three squishies of my own, and let me tell you, they live for these packets. You can find out more at kids.wearepcc.com. Wherever you are from around the world, we would love to connect with you. If you're new with us, please go to connect.wearepcc.com to access our connection card and we'll be in touch. If you're joining us from Facebook or the PCC website, I hope to see you in the chat. Let me ask those of you who are in the chat, did you have a New Year's resolution and are you still sticking with it? Share with us in the chat. Mine was to have no resolutions. <laughs> beat the system. Now I'd love to pray over our time together. <sighs> Father God, as we enter into this service today, one word just keeps coming up for me is hope. God, I know that this isn't what we thought 2021 would look like, at least for me. And I just pray that um, as we gather together and worship together, that we'll be reminded that you are hope. And even if we don't feel it, I pray that we will have faith in you for the hope of our future, God. In your name I pray, amen. Now I'm gonna hand it over to the music team as we spend some time worshiping together. We're gonna invite you right where you are. Just put your hands together with us. Yeah. We're gonna celebrate our King this morning. Here we go. Oh, 
I'm going to invite you to encourage the person who's there with you. And if you're not with anybody, you know, David in the book of Psalms, he encouraged himself. Let's encourage one another or yourself by saying this. Don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't feel evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where I am. Come one more time. Don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love. is our help. Thank you. There's nothing quite like the power of worship to bring us together. There are some exciting things happening here at PCC, so buckle up and let me share with you what's going on. Could you use some financial peace in 2021 from all the DoorDash in 2020? <laughs> if the answer is yes, then you might want to register for Financial Peace University. PCC is offering a nine session workshop series beginning January 25th through March 29th. You'll meet via Zoom on Monday nights from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Let's take a moment now to hear how financial peace has benefited some people right here in the PCC family. Hello, PCC, I'm Brian Wren, one of your pastors, and I'm with Jen today, who has greatly benefited from Financial Peace University and I would love for you to hear from her. So Jen, just start us off. Tell us about yourself. Hi, PCC. I'm Jen. I am married to a wonderful man named Hamish, uh, who I met in Dubai. Uh, he's South African. Uh, I'm a teacher. I taught in Marin County. I taught in Dubai. And now I teach in Belmont at Fox Elementary. Not long after I got to Belmont, I found PCC, um, and what's really great is uh, a friend of mine that I work with, Karen Bowman, also goes to PCC. That was a great connection when you told me that story with Karen. Yeah. Hey, tell me, Jen, what made you join the PCC Financial Peace University workshop last winter in 2020? When I was in Dubai, I was at the gym and I was listening to, um, I found Dave Ramsey's talk show and started listening to that. And I just, I didn't know where my, my money was going. I was in debt. I had a hole in my pocket. I didn't know where it was going. And I was worried about retirement. I was, I just, I, I had lost hope and I just felt like I was in chains and that something had to be done and I had had it. And my family member gave me Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover book. And I read it in 24 hours and it was the missing link. And I vowed that when I got back to the United States, I would get into a church and I would sign up for an FPU class. Mm. Well done, you followed through with that commitment. That's awesome. So tell us, what did FPU actually do for you? Well, first of all, it put me on a plan or, and I was able to um, control where my money went instead of wondering where it went. And as a result of having a plan, I'm no longer in debt. Wow, and as a result awesome. of that, yeah. And as a result of that, I just have peace of mind and I can sleep at night. And I have hope where I didn't have hope. And I can dream again when I had stopped dreaming. Mm. And I think the most important thing 
is that I can do what God wants me to do with the money he's given me and to give generously. Hmm. How wonderful. And what's amazing is you did follow through and got all those things and your class was canceled halfway through yeah, because of yeah. COVID, <laughs> but you followed through online. Well done, well done. Yes. So, hey, what would you tell someone who's considering joining FPU? What would be your final line to them? If you feel like your money is out of control, FPU can definitely help you. That is so true. Thanks, Jen, for sharing your experience. Jen will actually be one of our financial peace coaches during this upcoming session that starts in late January. She and I are hoping that whether you're single or married, you will join and have a similar experience. If you would like to join these nine sessions, you can register right now with these early bird spots at a reduced registration fee of $99 a person. To learn more or to register, visit wearepcc.com FPU. One of our six values here at PCC is giving generously. Through our church family's generosity, we are able to provide resources to allow our church to thrive your support allows us to put on midweek programs for children, middle schoolers, and high schoolers. Our youth are such priorities to us. Support missionaries who spread the love of Christ around the world and partner with World Vision to give food and care to our brothers and sisters right here in our community. If you are passionate about the work that PCC is doing, I'd love to invite you to invest in PCC by visiting wearepcc.com give or by texting GIVE to the number on your screen. And a huge, genuine thank you for all the ways that you invest in our mission here.
Let's sing it one more time. Just let's make this verse our prayer. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. PCC, I'm here with my good friend Herman Hamilton, and we are taking a message he gave to another partner church. Herman serves at New Beginnings Christian Church, and uh, he gave this message to Twin Lakes Church, but it's so good we wanted to pull it right into PCC. And so, Herman, I'm going to ask by way of introduction, uh, we're in this series on Habakkuk, which means to wrestle, uh, and it's MLK weekend. Dr. King was amazing as a man who held hope even while engaging in the wrestle of injustice. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain hope? And can you speak a little bit to Dr. Martin Luther King and his influence on you? Sure, sure, sure. First of all, let me just say thank you to you, Gary. It's an honor and a joy to be with you. I am such a huge fan of the ministry of PCC and the work that they're doing across the region. And hey guys, at PCC, listen, you guys know that your pastor prays regularly for you. Uh, what you do not know is that he extends that prayer ministry to uh, his colleagues across the Bay Area. I can't tell you how often I have received a text from Gary and Gary says, look, I'm doing my devotion. The Lord spoke to me about X, Y, and Z, and I've been praying for you. And here's the prayer that I'm sending to you on your behalf. It has just been so deeply meaningful. So Gary, thank you for your friendship, your partnership uh, in this shared ministry together. Thank you for allowing me to speak to your amazing congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, quickly, the answer, my answer, response to your question is, there's an insight that I got about Dr. King many years ago that really does continue to give me uh, hope. And it's helpful to remember that he's the Reverend Dr. King. So at the very center of his work is really this notion of the gospel. And here's the insight. Dr. King was not simply motivated by his deep love for the folk he was advocating for. Dr. King was motivated by his deep love for his enemies. And, uh, you, you know, the, at the heart of Jesus' teaching is, uh, is, is love your enemies. And Dr. King truly believed that if people could be exposed to the harm and the evil, even of their own efforts, that a combination of the power of God at work and, and a, the kind of decency of who we are uh, could combine uh, and that uh, people, you know, could be transformed. Yeah. And so that's my hope. I've seen it in operation. Mm -hmm. He saw it in operation as whites and blacks and Jews and Christians and others march together and work together. So uh, that gives me hope. Uh, whether we're talking about George Floyd or whether we're talking about what happened at the Capitol this past week. And that's why we shaped this message to try to give some insight how we can talk together across uh, all of our differences, believing that God can help us to hear each other and transform our hearts. Amen. Well, and it should be noted, you recorded this right after the murder of George Floyd. So you referenced that in the message. So PCC, I have heard this message at least five times, and I can't wait to hear it again. Lean in, get your pencils out, take notes, and let's be the reconciling community that Herman talks about. And Father, anoint this word now for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Herman, I love you. Thank you, bro. Praise God. Love you back, man. Yeah. All right, guys, listen, your pastor asked me to, to spend a few moments sharing with you guys something that I've been 
uh, saying to and teaching uh, my community here at New Beginnings Community Church uh, since the brutal death of uh, Mr. George Floyd as it relates to the role of Jesus followers uh, in this work of racial justice and racial reconciliation. Here's the deal that I've been saying, that God does not expect Jesus followers to simply participate in this work, in this defining moment, both in the world and in the nation. God expects Jesus followers, listen now, to be at the forefront of this work. Here's why. 24 hours before Jesus was crucified, he said to his disciples who were standing in proxy for all of, all of us who would be Jesus' followers. He says, look, I want you to love one another in the same way that I have loved you. And then he goes and he sacrifices his life on the cross. Remarkable, isn't it? And out of that sacrifice and his resurrection comes salvation and the gospel that is good news to all the people across all the different differences that make us who we are. And it strikes me that as Jesus followers in the church, that he actually meant what he said, that he actually intends for us to love one another across race and ethnicity in the same way that he loves us, which means that from time to time, we may be called upon to literally sacrifice our lives for others across race and ethnicity in pursuit of God's righteousness and justice in the world. Now, that's pretty deep. That's pretty deep. So, guys, we're called to be on the forefront of this unique moment in the history of the church and the world. And so with that, uh, let's read the text that I've been uh, doing a lot of work with over the past mm, six weeks or so. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. We'll start at verse 32. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and she said, Lord, if only you had been here. My brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing uh, with her, <clears throat> a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? Jesus asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby <clears throat> said, see how much he loved him? Jesus was still angry when he arrived at the tomb in a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. And so they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and he said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said this out loud for the sake of these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus! Come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a hand cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. There is the reading. Let me begin by, by offering to you at Twin Lakes a challenge that I offer to uh, the people here at NBCC. We call it a Connect Four challenge. And it is a set of principles that Jesus models as he interacts with Mary in this time of great pain. As we watch Mary fall at his feet, weeping, and the community around her wailing, Jesus models several principles. First, uh, we find him listening. He's listening. Second, we find him lamenting. The text says Jesus wept. Third, we find him teaching us how to lean in and learn from one another because the question is, where have you laid him? And the answer is, Lord, come and see. This notion of walking together with each other, a great metaphor for learning together. And then when he gets to the tomb, uh, he teaches us about praying together and acting together as he calls Lazarus out and he overturns what looks like permanent reality and makes it a better reality. These are four principles that we need to follow as we begin to engage with one another across race. So here's the challenge. I want you to practice these four principles as you identify two or three people of a different race and ethnicity and engage them in conversation around the question, share with me your story of race in America. 
Now, of course, if you're not African-American, those folk ought to be African-Americans that you're talking to, given this particular historical context. And obviously, if you're African-American, you're talking to people who are different than you. And if you practice these four principles, I'm suggesting that they will help to give birth to a transformative relationship that ultimately can impact the world around us. Now, when you pursue these dialogues, and the rest of this message is really about this, there are three hidden dangers that you just need to be aware of. They're going to be right there in the room, and you've got to navigate those dangers very well, or they just blow up the whole conversation. The first of these hidden dangers is what I want to call uh, hidden trauma that's in the room. The second is the unspoken skepticism, and the third is the displaced guilt. So let's take uh, first and foremost the hidden trauma. When I was a baby, <clears throat> I was severely scarred by chemical burns. So what that meant is that when I grew up, I grew up through my elementary, and middle school, and high school years as a kid that was significantly disfigured in my head. As a middle schooler, I remember always wearing a knit cap, particularly as I played outside. And even when I came back into the classroom, I'd have on that knit cap for as long as the teacher would allow me to, to have it on. But inevitably, she would see me with the cap and she would say, Herman, pull that cap off. And so I began to slowly pull that cap off. And as I pulled the cap off, uh, I would immediately feel exposed and embarrassed and remarkably different than anyone else in the room. And here's why. As I pulled that cap off, I wasn't just exposing my scars, guys. I was exposing my trauma. So here's the first thing that you've got to keep in mind as you do the work of racial dialogue across ethnicity is that when you're dialoguing with someone who is an African-American, you say, would you please share with me your story of race in America? You're not just simply asking that person to, 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 to pull off their cap and expose their scars. You're asking them, pull off your cap and expose your trauma. That awareness that you're having a conversation shaped around trauma should create some real sensitivity in how you have that conversation. Now, we see this played out dramatically here in the text. First of all, let me give you some broader context. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they're siblings. They live in Bethany. And whenever Jesus would go to Jerusalem, Bethany was a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. He would go and he would stay with them. He loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, the text tells us earlier. Lazarus takes sick. His sisters get word to Jesus. Lazarus is sick. Really, they're saying, he's dying. We need, he, we need your help. They don't hear from Jesus until after Lazarus dies and has been buried for four days. Then Jesus comes to town. Mary is so upset, she doesn't even want to see Jesus when, when, when he comes to town. When she first hears that he's, he, he's in town, she's, she doesn't go anywhere. Finally, she decides to leave her house and come. And that is where, where this text picks up. She throws herself at his feet. And, and, and that's why I say she's not just crying. She's really screaming at Jesus. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And in her own way, she is saying, to some degree, Lord, this is your fault. Because you could have made a difference. You could have kept him alive. You could have healed him. We, we've seen you heal people before. Now, note how Jesus responds. He doesn't take it personally. He doesn't try to defend or deflect uh, from what's going on. He doesn't say, Mary, I can't believe you're coming at me like that. Nothing. No. He, he recognizes that in that moment when she falls at her feet and cries out to him, that what Mary is doing is pulling off her cap and exposing to him her trauma. And that notion of interacting with her trauma shapes how Jesus reacts to her. And the first thing he does is he listens. And the second thing he does is he laments. Notice that verse 33 says that when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Then two verses later, it says, and Jesus wept. Mary was angry about the loss of her brother and Jesus alongside of Mary was angry about the loss of her brother. Mary was weeping over the loss of her brother and Jesus alongside Mary and the broader community was also weeping along about the loss of her brother. Jesus was lamenting with her. And what becomes obvious? Well, the verse says in verse 36, the people say, 
standing nearby, they say, see how much he loved him, Lazarus. In other words, because Jesus listened and lamented, ultimately his response to Mary's trauma was revealed love. You see, when you're having a conversation with an African-American around their trauma as it relates to race, that is not a time to have a political discussion. It's not a time to talk about social policy. It is simply a time to love, to lament with them. Secondly, in the room is unspoken skepticism. Let's return to the text. You know, in that statement, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I think reveals some real uh, issues of skepticism that Mary is articulating. Here's what I mean. What she's, if you pull the lens of the text back further, look at the context, here's what she's really saying. Hey, listen, Jesus, we've been there for you. For three years, you lived with us. We fed you. We supported you. We encouraged you. We've believed what you've taught. We've advocated on your behalf. And the one time we needed you absolutely the most, you did not show up. I'm not sure I can fully trust you, I think is the implication in, in, in Mary's uh, words. A little skepticism. Anybody who feels like Jesus hasn't shown up at the moment that you really needed him, you may have not said that out loud, but you know what it feels like. You say, I'm not really sure I can trust you, Jesus. We've all had those moments. Well, that skepticism exists on both sides of the table when we're dealing with race and racial dialogue between people who don't know each other. Of course, that skepticism has a context. The first context for skepticism when we're talking to each other across race and ethnicity, it's just simply the lack of relationships, right? You know, I guess the question I would ask here is, if you're not African-American, how many, how many African-American friends do you actually have? If you are African-American, how many white or Asian or people of other ethnicity friends do you actually have? Where there are no relationships, when you get ready to talk about race, there's real skepticism that comes to that conversation from both sides, right? The second area of skepticism, a uh, context of skepticism, is the absence of the lived experience of systemic racism. Now let's go back to the text. Jesus asks only one question. He says only one thing in the first por few portions of this passage. It's a question that he asks. Where have you put him? In other words, Jesus is saying, where have you put the body of Lazarus? Here's my expectation. I would have thought that the answer would have been, we buried him on the other side of town in the graveyard. What they actually say is this, come and see. In other words, Jesus, come walk with us. Come do this walk of solidarity in the midst of our grief as we head towards where he, 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 we've buried him. And Jesus could not walk in their shoes, but he could walk alongside of them. Here is an invitation, I think, that is shaped by the text that the Holy Spirit drives home, which says, hey, start with the dialogue, but never be satisfied with the dialogue. Listen, you and I, we have to walk together. We, 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 we've, we've got to do some life together so that you can, you can learn what it's like for me to be uh, an African-American in this country and I can learn what it's like, I can see this country through the lenses, through your eyes as well. Let's walk together. Powerful imagery, a metaphor for learning from one another. All right, here's why I make this point. Listen, talking about skepticism. I've often shared with people, uh, oftentimes maybe white or Asian, about uh, a story of racial injustice that I've experienced. And the response usually is something like, well, uh, often is, uh, well, that's a horrible story, but I'm still not convinced that's racial bias or that's part of a systemic racism. By the way, racism is prejudice plus institutional power, the power to actually actualize that prejudice in policies and practices. And when I hear someone say that, it's, it's hurtful, right? The first thing I think is, you have the luxury of saying that because you've never lived one day as an African American. And what I wanna say to them is, come see. 
Come walk with me. Uh, let's just take a few moments. And let me just take you on a little walk with me. I've got 55 years of being black in America. Let me sh let you see it through my lens, a portion of it as it relates to racial justice. Uh, in elementary school, my elementary class, 1970, was the first integrated class in Coachella, Louisiana. And when we launched, uh, a lot of the white parents pulled their kids out of the school with the support of the public school board and built a private school because they didn't want their students to be contaminated by those of us who were African-American kids. In college, at Gramlin State University in the town of Gramlin, northern Louisiana, Grambling is a historic African-American college, a university. I led an effort and fought and won uh, the capacity for the town of Grambling to build its own well-equipped clinic to service the citizens and students of their community. Why? Because we just got tired of going five miles to Ruston, Louisiana, uh, where day after day and week after week and year after year, we were horribly humiliated and mistreated in the healthcare centers in Ruston, just because of the color of our skin. When I went to seminary uh, here in the Bay Area, I remember one Sunday afternoon pulling up in front of my stepfather's house, uh, well-dressed, my wife was well-dressed, a baby in the back. I just finished preaching at the local church. Suddenly the police cars uh, pulled in behind us, hemmed us in, police came out, surrounded us, hands on their guns. Come to find out mistaken identity. But a dangerous moment. And then I remember in Arkansas, young pastor, my first church, Faith Presbyterian Church, leading an effort to push back against those banks that drew a red line around certain zip codes. We call that redlining. And if you lived in those zip codes, predominantly black people did, uh, they wouldn't give you a mortgage. If they did, it was extremely high. I remember arriving as a young pastor in Boston three and a half years later, and I walked into a Woolworth store, pulled out a wallet that had several credit cards in it, used a credit card to pay for an item. The woman who took the credit card said, wait, for no other reason than, than who I was with several credit cards. She took that credit card back, gave it to her manager. The manager called the credit card company. The credit card company called my wife and said, uh, can you check in with your husband? We think his credit cards have been stolen. Here I was humiliated like a criminal at the Woolworth store, and I was simply a preacher trying to purchase a few items. You follow me? Right? Just the other day, I go into a corner store. Forget all the other folk in the store. The person behind the counter pays attention solely to me. Come walk with me. So be careful. When you delegitimate my experience of race in America, you delegitimate me. So we've got to be aware of the hidden trauma in the room, and we have to be aware of the unspoken skepticism in the room. Now, let me hasten towards the conclusion. The third thing you want to be aware of is displaced guilt. Listen, verse 38 says Jesus shows up at the tomb. He's full of anger, but he's not full of guilt. Why? Let me ask a, a different question. How is it that Jesus didn't take personally what Mary, when Mary came at him in verse 32? Why, why didn't he didn't feel the need to defend himself and deflect and all that? Because Jesus knew that it was not his fault that Lazarus died. It wasn't. But he also knew in that moment that that would be his moment for him to reveal to the world exactly who he was. Right? Now, I want to call this out. This is extremely important. For African Americans, I really want you to lean in and listen here. Whenever we have dialogue with people who are white and Asian and others, specifically because of the historical context, the question that lingers in the air, for many white people in particular, is this. Are you saying that all white people are responsible for systemic racism in America? Are you saying that all white people are responsible for what you experienced, Pastor Herman, what you just shared over the last 55 years? And listen, we're not a homogeneous communi uh, community around the answer to this. There are a lot of African Americans who will say, absolutely, you're either directly responsible or you're indirectly responsible because you benefit from 
racism in America. I just want you to know I push back hard against that, right? I, I say a resounding no. It's not your fault, but it is your opportunity to step forth and, and, and reveal to the world who you are as Jesus follows, using your power and your influence in the various spheres of influences, influence that you have to make a difference. So I would celebrate my friend uh, John Kingston, who just recently wrote an article to Christianity Today calling out racism in the, in, the, in the evangelical church against people saying, don't do it, don't do it. I'd celebrate Pastor Dan Monroe, who um, in a public meeting said recently, look, I don't know what it's like to be African-American, but with tears coming down his cheeks, he says, uh, uh, but I, but I want to learn. I want to learn and inspire others who surrounded that experience to say, I want to follow your lead, using his power in his sphere of influence to make a difference. Look at how this works itself out in the text. Jesus is standing at the tomb. And, and, and the first thing he says is he says to some people, he says, look, roll the stone away. Look, those people who rolled the stone away, they couldn't call Lazarus out, but they could be stone rollers. Some of you are stone rollers, right? What's your sphere of influence? Some of you, your task is to remove the obstacles so that, that the gospel and, and the power of God can, 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 can call justice out of injustice, right? Then Jesus calls for Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And, and the text says the dead man comes out and Jesus takes what is permanent reality and based because of his authority, he overturns that permanent reality. And, 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 and again, and life comes out of death. Only Jesus can do that. But then there are some folks standing around. And as a friend of mine said, when Lazarus comes out, he was a live man still wearing a dead man's clothes. So Jesus says to some other folk, it's, it, unwrap him. Right? Right? As the King James Version says, loose him and let him go. So, so it was, it, you, you, may, you may be among those who are doing the unwrapping, right? It may be your responsibility to help untangle 400 years of consequences of injustice that have come out of slavery and segregation that continues to plague this nation around racial, r racial reconciliation and racial justice. Right? Here's my point. Assess what's your sphere of influence, whether it's in the local corner grocery store or in the classroom or in the corner executive office. Your sphere of influence. Is it at the ballot box or in the boardroom? Your sphere of influence. Where, where is it? Is it creating forums for people to talk about these kind of issues? Or is it, I mean, what, what's your, is it having a conversation with your grandparents or your grandkids? God is saying, whatever your sphere of influence is, step forward, expose yourself as a Jesus follower, and allow him to use you as an instrument to push back against the sin of racism. Now, here's where I want to end. This is my favorite piece here. Uh, two quick things. One, before Jesus executes the miracle, he prays. It's, it's, it's as though he's saying, look, a uh, father... I want you to reveal the totality of who you are through me in this moment. And I need all of the power of eternity to, to, to turn this thing around. It is a reminder to us that racism, like any other sin, is in fact just that, a sin. And at the end of the day, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, as Paul says, against black and white. But we are wrestling against powers and principalities and forms of wickedness in high places. And at the end of the day, it can only be accomplished. Uh, yes, we need policy. And yes, protesting is appropriate. But ultimately, it is the spirit of God that transforms the heart and minds of people in the work and in the name of Jesus Christ. It is that Jesus who ultimately will die on the cross for all of our sins across every race and every ethnicity. It is that Jesus who will go into the grave. It is that Jesus who gets up with all authority of heaven and earth in his hand. It is that Jesus who says to, 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 to those of you who want to be a part of the healing of this nation, he says, put your faith in me. Claim me as Lord and as Savior and follow my lead. Listen and lament and learn and lift up righteousness and justice as you pray together. And, and, and as you act together, and it is that same Jesus that says to those who have been wounded and who've been hurt, come and join 
me in my body, call the church and, 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 and allow me to be a part of your healing. And then he pours out his blood on those who have been wounded, on those who want to be healed. And, and, and he, he creates one community, the church, out of black and white and Asian and Latino, <laughs> rich and poor. And he takes that one community that's been redeemed by his blood and he transforms us into an unstoppable force of righteousness and justice in the world all because he is our lord our savior our redeemer and the highest standard for how we live our lives it is that jesus that invites us to follow him as jesus followers move to the forefront of this work in a defining moment god bless you and it's been a joy to minister to you Thank you, Herman. This series is really exciting for me because I discovered this book in one of the lowest points of my life. I remember the exact room I was in when the pages fell, literally fell out of my Bible and I reached to pick it up. It was this book. After this service, I'd love to invite you to come say hi on our virtual patio. Reconnect and meet new people. Also, our pastors are available and ready to chat with you privately and to pray with you. You can find the Zoom link in the chat. Now let's say our benediction together. May you jump into the arms of Jesus and may he push you out into the world. And may you be healed as you participate in the healing of others. Not because you must, but because you may. This is why we were born. Woo!